Hi, good morning. Uh, this is the Gardner community meeting. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, because I had some issues with the sharing. Okay, to, today we have a packed agenda. We have four topics. Uh, Lucas will talk about uh, some updates on the dashboard. Uh, Peter will give an update on uh, dashboard terminals. Uh, then Raphael will uh, introduce the garden lab. And finally, Hardik will talk about NPD integration with Gardner. So, Lucas, uh, you can take over. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I want to give you an update um, of the things that we are currently working on in the dashboard and also things that we released since our last update. So most importantly, we now released um, this week the web terminal support. Um, we already gave um, uh, a demo of this feature a few weeks ago, but we um, worked on improvements and introduced new features. So Peter will give another demo in a few minutes. We are also working on migrating to the new Gardener API group, to the new Gardener resources. And this also comes with some improvements to, to the dashboard. I can already show you some improvements here. Okay. Uh, you're not sharing so yeah, far. Yeah, I'm not sharing, but I'm okay. sharing now. So can you see the dashboard? Yes. Okay, so we now um, support to, as just an, as an example, uh, we what what comes with this new new um, resources. We now support to configure the zones of each cluster, not only for um, for a whole cluster, but for each worker group. And this also um, uh, we also now have full support for for um, multi zone clusters for creating multi zone clusters. So in in the last or in the current dashboard. For example, AWS requires you to configure your networks for each zone, and this is um, requires um, manual um, configuration in the YAML. But with the new uh, with the new dashboard version that we will release in a few weeks, um, it is possible to configure um, your zones here in the UI and get your network configuration um, dynamically. Um, adjusted to, to your zones. Um, another thing that we um, introduced or already released is um, the support for rotating your your um, cube config credentials. So um, I can show you this feature. So in case that you accidentally leaked your credentials or a member left your team, uh, it's now easily possible to um, change uh, or rotate the cube config using the dashboard. We have um, a button for this here. And by the way, um, we also um, have uh, this new this new um, info box here for newer clusters that um, require you to log in to the Kubernetes dashboard using kubectl proxy and um, your your token. Um, we we show this information here, um, and you can also show the token and copy it. So we will now see that if I rotate the cube config, we should see another token here. Um, so we we remember that it starts with I O something, and I now press the button. So you get. Um, you need to confirm this uh, action as it um, it has some some significant um, impact as all um, cube configs that are used somewhere will not work anymore. So if you have a pipeline or something running, um, <clears throat> this will take some some seconds, and then um, we should um, see um, a new token. Um, and we also. Um, um, switched our dependency management from npm to yarn. This is uh, important if you try to to run the dashboard locally. Um, you now need yarn to to start and to to fetch your dependencies. 
So okay, the the cube config should now be rotated, and uh, okay. the reconcile is still running. Ah, uh, reconcile is running. Okay, then just need to wait some some few more uh, seconds. Uh, or you just believe me that? Oh, okay, it should now. I think we need to reload here. This is also something that um, currently we this is not um, re uh, reactive, so we need to reload this page. Is also something we are working on okay it's rotated good okay so um that's it for my presentation so peter you can take over and show now you should rotate rotate once more because it's in the uh, i will now. i will delete it <laughs> <laughs> okay okay uh so what is my this? presentation what uh, okay. what uh, uh, do you see my screen or? Yes, I see some okay. baby. Baby, oh. <laughs> then, one second. Uh, wait. I'll be able to record the contents of your screen. I think I have to reconnect. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you probably need to to yeah because uh, of the new macOS update yeah, yeah. and restart too. Okay. Now I guess it will should work. Share. Share. Oh, cancel. Yep. Also. Okay. So uh, now I show you the uh, the web terminal feature. So I will um, show you um, our two roles. So. As you know, we have uh, two different roles in the dashboard, the operator and the uh, regular let's say, end user. And now I will log as a regular user. And uh, also a user has access uh, to the terminal feature, but not to, not to the extent like the operator has. But uh, we will see that now. So I have here my cluster list. Um, let's open uh, the details for my cluster. And here we have this uh, new uh, section under the access uh, uh, card where I can open the uh, a terminal for the cluster, which I will do now. And um, and what happened now, it scheduled the pod on my cluster um, with uh, the ops tool belt as container. And the ops tool belt has all the uh, necessary tools to uh, to work with your cluster, debug it maybe. Um, so we have kubectl here. You can list the pods. And uh, as you can see here, um, there was a temporary namespace created for the terminal pod. And um, this one is running in this namespace. So this is where I'm currently connected to. So as a user, um, you see you're connected uh, to the container or to the pod and um, you see the uh, image is, which is used that it's an unprivileged terminal session and the node on which uh, the pod is running. <clears throat> and uh, when you click on any of these buttons or on the settings at the bottom right, you can uh, change the settings. So if you have uh, your own image, your own tool belt with your own tools, um, you can uh, specify or change it here and uh, you can select the node on which the pod should be scheduled and usually you would do that if you want to uh, debug the node itself and in this case you probably also want to have a privileged pod so let's do that now and here you have uh, so now it looks like i'm on the uh, node or on the worker itself i see all the processes um, the host root file system is uh, mounted under the host root 
uh, path. Currently, we do not automatically do a change route, but yeah, you can do it also here manually. And maybe we also have an automatism for that in the future in the dashboard. Okay, and um, so what we um, also have uh, in the ops tool belt itself, we have um, like an installer script. I have a, let's copy it here for a tool named K9S, uh, which is also nice to have a more graphical UI uh, on a few of your uh, cluster of your pods or deployments or whatever. So when I uh, hit enter, I see uh, the container of this pod. I can press uh, the Y key to see the YAML. Um, I can type um, alias here with, so I typed a uh, colon and this opened this uh, input prompt. And you can see uh, the aliases or the, uh, um, the resources that you can list, uh, custom resources, uh, deployments, for example, or services, let's open the services. And um, when you now hit enter, you are, your, um, you can you can see the pot behind this service, uh, or yeah, which is exposed by this service, and um, or you type it here deployment. I can see all the deployments. So I just wanted to um, just show uh, that this tool is also available, uh, which is I guess pretty nice. You can also hide the header if you want to press the header key, and if you press the question mark key you see uh, the help for this uh, K9S tool. Okay, but I don't want to show too much of this K9S because um, this uh, session is about the web terminals of the dashboard. Okay. Um, yeah, so that was the part uh, for what I wanted to show you for an end user of the dashboard and now I will log on as, um, as operator. So I can just refresh and as you can see here, I'm now operator. And what's different now is uh, there's another section, another card here, the control plane. So as an operator, I can also access the control plane of a cluster. And I can list the pods for this, for the control plane. Do, um, I can uh, also change here the image. I can also take a look at the cluster like the regular or like the normal user can. Um, same here. The difference is where we schedule the pod. So for the operator, we schedule the pod on the uh, on the seed. Um, but I can also uh, choose. So as an operator, if I want to debug a worker node uh, um, of this cluster, I can select the uh, the runtime. So, uh, where this where the pod should be hosted and uh, here I can select a cluster privilege mode is automatically selected because in this case you probably want to debug the worker node you can uh, select in, uh, the node in this case this cluster only has one node and uh, also we have here this uh, information that the terminal will be running in an untrusted environment which means uh, the uh, cluster owner can or has uh, um, or can see the terminal pod that is scheduled and could also attach to it or, or modify it or whatever. So uh, you, um, so this is just to make sure that the operator is aware he doesn't enter any credentials that the um, cluster owner should not see and so on. <clears throat> and um, yeah, so we could take a look if this works. So now um, at the bottom, we see uh, this GCP CPU worker, and if I change it now, it's uh, yeah, the a different worker of this. Uh, so the worker of the, of the cluster and not of the seed. As an operator, also I have access to the garden cluster. So I can list the shoots, and um, I can also see the uh, terminal. Uh, resources that are the terminal session that is created. So for each uh, terminal that you open, we, um, so this uh, 
terminal resource is created and we can also take a look at it. And basically it has uh, um, the information about the cluster that hosts the pod and where, um, and, uh, and also the information about the target cluster where you want to uh, uh, connect to or where the kubectl should point to. And um, this terminal session has a lifetime of five minutes um, when it doesn't receive any heartbeat anymore. So as long as I have the terminal window open with uh, the terminal session or the terminal resource, get a heartbeat. And um, yeah, when I close it, uh, after five minutes, it will be cleaned up. So this is currently uh, hard coded, but in the future it will be configurable for the operator. And, uh, or I can forcefully, or I just can uh, clean it up or um, terminate the session by pressing this exit button. And um, what happens uh, when, I, when the terminal session or the terminal resource is deleted, it will, uh, of course, um, delete the pod and it will revoke the uh, service account. So for what I haven't mentioned now was um, for each terminal session, we um, create a new service account specific for this user. Um, and after the terminal session is uh, terminated, we also revoke uh, the service account. So I can, so the, the, uh, the commands works now. So, but if I uh, delete the terminal session, uh, terminal, Oops. Oh, stupid. Um, in a few seconds, I should not uh, have access anymore to the cluster. Yeah, now I'm unauthorized, and um, a few seconds. Uh, in a few seconds, I should also not have. Um, I should be disconnected from the uh, terminal because, of course, the pod is deleted. But as we can see, it's still working. Yeah, now I lost the connection. So now it's, everything is cleaned up. Um, yeah, so in the past, I already showed the terminal feature. But uh, in the meantime, we uh, threw part of it away and uh, re-implemented it because uh, we faced some issues, um, most, uh, um, mostly regarding the cleanup of the terminal session. So in the past, we had a, uh, it's like a cron job running that, um, that deleted the terminal pods and cleaned uh, all the stuff. Um, um, that were created for this terminal session, and um, but uh, we had problems uh, for the end user terminals, um, and um, so we also had we would need to look into the um, worker cluster itself and clean um, the terminals uh, there, um, which we hadn't or so. For the operators, we only need to look at the seeds because we schedule the pods on the seeds. And um, but when we introduce the feature for the end users, uh, of course, the pods will be running in the uh, in the cluster of the uh, of the end uh, or um, not on our infrastructure nodes. And um, so we would have to look at all the shoots and regularly check them is there a pot running and so on so this would not be too performant and would take up too many uh, resources so um, we wrote our uh, own controller so we have a terminal controller manager um, that acts upon those terminal resources and uh, he knows where to look and what to delete so this is performant also um, yeah I guess that's it what I wanted to show are there any questions so and uh, just uh, the prerequisite if you want to also uh, use this terminal feature is um, we need to have a browser trusted certificate for the cube API server and what we do is we um, we create an ingress 
and let a, um, a component issue a certificate like a, the cert manager or also Gardner has known component for a certificate management and this component will um, um, yeah, request the certificate from for example let's encrypt and um, yeah by that means we, we then have a, a browser trust certificate for the Kube API server and this needs to be available otherwise the terminal doesn't work so the browser uh, rejects uh, if we reject the connection if we try to um, connect to the API server that presents a uh, self-signed certificate uh, That's it. Thanks, Peter. Are there any questions? Uh, is that already in a release or is that work in progress? This is already released, yes. Okay. In the uh, 135 uh, dashboard version. Looks great. Huh? Okay, if there are no more questions, then we can go to the next topic. I think uh, Hardik is uh, the next on the list. Oh, yes, sure. Let me share screen. Okay, hope the screen is visible already. Yes, we can see it. Perfect. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the node problem detector and the recent integration of it with the gardener. So uh, before we get into these uh, what was the exact problem that we faced and why on the first minute we thought about it. So basically, if you're aware of a little bit of the ecosystem of Gardner and Machine Controller Manager, you would know that Machine Controller Manager earlier was anyway be able to replace the machines which are unhealthy. So the machines which are, let's say, are having kubelet not ready from 10 minutes or disk pressure is high from 10 minutes and so on. But then um, we started seeing the cases where the machines are actually from the Kubernetes point of view, healthy. So when you do the get nodes, you see everything is ready, all the nodes are ready, but then there are some intrinsic problems in the machine. So which could be your file system has been converted into the read only, for example, or certain tasks are completely hung, your Docker is probably hung and so on. And in such cases, uh, we ended up in a situation where there was no way for us or, or for MCM to identify whether machine is uh, not doing well and do anything about it. And that's where the topic came in that uh, we thought maybe we need more uh, tool, we, we need a tool which can basically identify the problems at the low level of the machine. And that's where no problem detector kicks in. So what NPD does ideally is, is very simple. It's basically, as the name suggests, it just detects the problems and then simply reports the problems to the API server. And it's basically nothing but a demon set. So Basically, you, you, you see a uh, privilege agent running on each machine, which has uh, some sort of log parser you will see uh, in, in the next slides, which basically checks if that if there is a problem with the machine, then it will report it to the API server in two main ways. One is via the events, the Kubernetes standard events, and uh, the other is via the node conditions. And of course, this is a an, an, uh, community, uh, Kubernetes community supported project. So these two types of problems are, are, are basically referred as um, temporary problems and the permanent problems. So uh, what happens many times is that uh, sometimes machine has certain problems, but they are, they are not that critical that you need to necessarily replace the machine or bring the new one. They are simple as one of your containers is probably home killing or certain internal operating system tasks are hung and so on. So there could be some remedy uh, you could do on that and probably the machine uh, would be fine again. So what NPD does is that for such temporary problems, it only creates the Kubernetes events and expects that user will take care of the rest of the things. But then there are other problems where there could be something uh, really going wrong with the machine, which is actually a kernel deadlock or read-only file systems and so on. So where uh, once this happens, uh, the machine is unhealthy for a long time. You cannot really do anything about it. You have to probably uh, replace the entire machine and such problems referred as permanent problems are basically reported via the node conditions in the node object. So uh, each, each node object status basically contains many node conditions. In now, um, how is it done? So uh, this is, I think, uh, the really interesting and beauty of NPD. It's done in, in extremely simple way and 
it is also really easily extensible. So if, if, you, if you look at the screenshots on the screen, what it simply does is that it basically looks at your log path information, whatever you mentioned. If I say, okay, go to the dev k message, and then it creates a hook on it, and, and then it starts looking for patterns of the log. So uh, if in the ongoing logs, it, if it sees a pattern of the log, which says a remote, remounting file system read only, if, if it finds such log, then it identifies this as a permanent problem. And then as mentioned earlier, it creates the uh, node condition read only file system. In a similar way, if it finds some other kind of pattern, which is task unmount or blocked for a certain number of seconds and so on, then also it creates similar kind of uh, node conditions or reports the events. So with that done, uh, quickly, uh, how, how, how does it look like with the gardener? So what, what we what we do with the gardener is that we simply deploy it by default as a daemon set on the user's uh, API server. And this brings us the new uh, conditions uh, visible as of now. Uh, uh, earlier, if you, if you know earlier, you would you were able to see only four to five standard conditions, but now you will be able to see more node conditions on your node object. It also include, include uh, if your Docker is continuously restarting or your Kubernetes is continuously restarting and uh, stuff like that. At the end, uh, with, with the Gardener, it, uh, it's just the one step of integration where, um, but, but the other step of the integration is actually the reaction on such conditions, which, which comes with the machine controller manager. So but what, we, what we do here is that MCM, Earlier, as I said, used to only look at two conditions, ready and disk pressure. Now it also looks at two more node conditions, which is kernel deadlock and read-only file system. So if, uh, for now, these are a minimal set of conditions that we are uh, that we are looking at. But in future, we plan that when it, as and when we see a requirement of more node conditions to be act on or more events to be act on, we'll probably grow our reach on the NPD and enhance the MCM in a similar way. So uh, right now you can think of it in a way that MCM would basically wait for 10 minutes and if any of the node conditions are set for 10 minutes, you MCM will basically replace with the new machine. So let's quickly see uh, how does it actually work. So, so on the screen, what you are seeing is on the uh, left side bottom, I, you, are, you are seeing the uh, machine controller manager logs. On the right side, I have a shoot cluster running and uh, I'm, I'm watching simply nodes looking major and on the left uh, side on the top what i have done is i basically grabbed the read only file system node conditions of both of the nodes so what i what i want to show as part of the demo is that uh, let's fake the file system to be read only so i have basically installed a pod which is a privilege pod which i will use to ssh in, inside the machine so, so right now we are in the S, uh, we, are, we are in the specific machine. Now I'll try to see it to get a feel of being inside the machine. So now uh, this is how uh, I, I would SSH in it. And then what what we'll do is basically simply write a message on a DOK message. So as I said, it's, it's, it's nothing but a log parser. If I write a message, it will, uh, NPD is already looking at this particular location and it will immediately see that something has changed, which changes the node condition here. The read-only file system node condition is now changed to two, which means one of the machines has uh, got the problem with the file system. And MCM, as you, as you see, uh, in, in the MCM right now, the MCM which is running right now is specifically for the demo. So it's generally it would act after the 10 minutes, but at the moment it will act immediately in the 10 seconds. So as you see in 10 seconds, it decided that because the file system has become read-only, it deleted the machine and we replaced it simply by the new machine. And here you would see that the standard procedure of deletion of the machine will start where we try to drain the machine. We'll have a small drain timeout period. If drain is successful, good. Otherwise, we'll anyway go ahead and delete the machine there. And we will soon see that the new machine with the fresh uh, file system will be available here. So I, it will, I think, take one minute, one or two minutes or so. So during this time period, uh, if there are any questions or anything, I would love to answer. 
Yeah, I would have a question. Um, so first of all, thanks for the great feature. That's really cool because in the test machinery, you know, we faced sometimes the, the read-only file system problem and the file system got corrupt, right? Uh, one question, I mean, you showed that NPD uh, distance between temporary and permanent errors. Um, mm -hmm. So what's the rationale for MCM in case of permanent errors to wait 10 minutes? I mean, that error is not supposed to go away if it's a permanent one. Wouldn't it make more sense to react immediately? Uh, it would probably make uh, more sense to react immediately in the case of file system read only explicitly. But right now, uh, we have a health check timeout where we expect that the health okay. check timeout by default time is good. Your, your, your input is actually pretty good. Uh, we can probably think about it. If certain conditions which are anyway be not resolvable, then we should probably replace them immediately. That's a good point. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thanks for the suggestion. And as you can see, the new node is already available. Is there and any, how do uh, we currently deploy, I mean, the daemon set for the NPD? Is it in the worker control or? No, it's a, it's a basically a shoot core um, add-on. So it's, oh. it's just a chart. Oh, OK. Mm -hmm. And uh, in parallel to kube proxy and so on. So user would basically be able to see it in the, in the API server. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks, Hardik. Are there, are there any other questions? Seems not to be the case. Then uh, the last uh, topic is uh, garden led by Raphael. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, Right. So uh, I want to take or give a short presentation about the garden lead. Um, most of you probably still know what it is. Uh, back from the first presentation or the first uh, inception of the idea from Martin last year. Um, and now that extensibility, at least the large parts are done, we had finally time to implement it. So yeah. For those that don't know what it is, um, let's again take a look. So first of all, how does the Kubernetes control plane look like? We have a Kube API server, we have a, a controller manager and a scheduler. We have worker nodes and a kubelet running there. And now pods get created by a kubectl or whatever mechanism at the API server. They get scheduled by the scheduler to some worker nodes and the kubelet will uh, the containers. So um, interestingly, we can apply exactly the same architecture to, to Gardner. So we also have our API server, which um, serves the shoot cloud profile, C3 sources, and so on. We have the Gardner control manager, which reconciles all these resources. And we have recently, a few months ago, introduced the Gardner scheduler, which basically, uh, yeah, schedules shoots to seed nodes. So shoot clusters are created at the Gardner API server. The Gardner scheduler finds the best seed. And yeah, then the shoot will, or at least the control plane will be running in the seed cluster. And what we have now done is to add this Gardner component, which is basically not much more than splitting the or several control loops of the Gardner controller manager into a dedicated uh, binary. So the Gardner basically has uh, the shoot controller and is now connecting um, to the Gardner API server from the cluster itself and reconciling only those shoots that are scheduled to its dedicated seed. Um, yeah. So why do we do this? Mainly for uh, scalability reasons, because in the past we had the central Gardner controller manager here, uh, which reconciled all the shoots on all the seats. And uh, yeah, in order to scale even beyond thousands of clusters, we already knew that we have to distribute this logic 
at a certain point in time and now was a good time to introduce it. So the shoot controller is basically now running once per seat and yeah, doing much less work now because only a fraction of the shoots is on, on one or one of the same seats. Um, also, this opens up um, to run seat clusters behind firewalls and then also shoot clusters, of course. So we don't need connectivity from the garden cluster to the seats and shoots anymore, but only vice versa from the seat to the garden. And uh, the garden let can talk cluster internally with the cube API servers of the shoots that run in the same cluster. Um, yeah, we have done it in a way that it's also possible to still preserve the old uh, design, so to say, where the shoot controller is only run running once in the garden cluster. Um, this is mainly for development reasons, because here we don't want to, to have uh, for every seat a dedicated garden let running, but only one that does the work for all the, the seats. Um, yeah, in the end, it opens up uh, the freedom to design the landscape in the way the garden operator wants it to be. Okay, so the overall architecture, this is the old picture, quite outdated, and a lot is missing here, especially the extensions. But the main difference is the gardener controller manager, which was here talking uh, to the seed cluster, API load balancers. Um, yeah, this is basically gone. So what is now happening is the garden let is, is running as a deployment in the seats and it talks to the garden cluster. So the other di direction basically. And we also have the gardener scheduler running here. But for shoot maintenance, we still need to talk to the um, seat or? Why? Not, not sure because um, it's, uh, I, I mean, the maintenance mode for the shoot controller is still in the um, garden controller manager, right? On the garden cluster and mm -hmm. if you want to reconcile it or, or didn't I get that right? So yeah. I, I will come to that point in a, in a few minutes. Ah, okay. Thank you. So, yeah. Other questions to this new architecture picture, <laughs> which is still quite overwhelming, of course. But <laughs> okay. Uh, so this is a more detailed view, um, at least a little bit. So in the garden cluster, in the garden namespace, we have the control plane of, of Gardener, API server, controller, manager, scheduler. We have the project namespaces of the different development teams and shoot resources living here, uh, which have certain infrastructure type and, and reference a seed cluster where they get scheduled to, so very similar to, to pods. And uh, in the seed cluster, the garden let runs together with the extension controllers and the control planes of the shoot scheduled here. Okay, so for those that know how uh, the TLS bootstrapping is done for Kubernetes, so when the kubelet is um, installed on a worker node, it somehow needs to get a kube config in order to talk to the kube API server and to fetch the, the pods that it needs to run and so on. Um, we have the same problem basically, so the garden let gets installed to a seed cluster and it needs to talk to the, to the garden API server to list all the, the shoots it is responsible for. So we have basically implemented exactly the same mechanism. Um, what needs to happen is that the one that deploys the garden let into the seed, we also need to create a, a so-called bootstrap token in the garden cluster, which is only valid for a short period of time and which allows to create the certificate signing request resources that are served by the standard Kubernetes API. So what the garden that will do, it uses this bootstrap token in order to create such a uh, certificate request. Then the certificate, re oops, the certificate request gets auto approved by the gardener controller manager when it sees that it's coming from the garden let. And this will then lead to a client certificate that can be used in order to talk to the garden cluster. It's, it's exactly the same process like for the cubelet. 
And what we haven't done yet is the certificate rotation, but we will do it shortly afterwards. So these, these client certificates that are issued here are only valid for a year. So at least after a year, uh, a new one needs to be uh, requested and the cube config needs to be refreshed. So this is not yet done, but I said we will do it. And we have two different, the two different modes I already mentioned. So seed config is uh, the standard mode, so to say. It's, uh, it contains information about the seed cluster. So basically the seed specification and when the garden let starts up, the seed object is then automatically registered. So this again, similar to how the, the node object is created in the Kubernetes API server so when the cube that starts up. The other mode is a seed selector. So this is the mode for development or yeah, whatever else you can think of. You can basically provide uh, a label selector to the garden led configuration. And uh, this would make it possible to select even multiple seats or also all, all the seats. We won't use it, of course, in, in production, but it's yeah, up to the, the operator or the landscape administrator to de de uh, design how it should be. Then we have like the kubelet heartbeats. So the garden let sends, I think every 20 seconds or so, heartbeats uh, to the garden control plane. The gardener controller manager is observing this and monitoring the heartbeats. And the gardener scheduler is also taking the garden led status, or basically the seed status into account when new shoots are to be scheduled. Um, yeah, we will see this in a minute. Uh, Martin already suggested to, to move to lease objects. So there was a Kubernetes enhancement proposal for, for the kubelet heartbeats. Uh, and we also plan to do the same. Okay, and shooted seeds. So Gardner can also deploy, or you can also deploy shoots with Gardner that later can, can be automatically registered as seeds. In the past, this was simply done by creating the seed object. What uh, now happens is the Gardner that creates the shoot that shall be then registered as a seed would simply deploy itself into this cluster it just created. And this will happen with the same version and the same configuration, basically. And yeah, whenever this, this root garden let, so to say, is updated, it will also update all the garden lets in, the, in these shooter feeds that it is responsible for. Okay. Um, next part would be a demo. Do we have any questions before that? Then let's start. So what I have here is uh, a garden cluster. I'm just showing what's, what's uh, running here. So we have cloud profiles for AWS, Google OpenStack. Doesn't matter, basically. We have two projects. Um, we also have some extensions that are registered, so Core, Escalico, and so on. And in the garden namespace, we run the control plane of Gardener. And we also run the garden let here. So this, what you see here, you can basically compare with a single node, Kubernetes cluster, where the kubelet also run on the, runs on the master node. Um, this garden cluster has been registered as seed also, because the garden let Oops, the garden let is running here as well. And we have uh, also a shoot cluster that was created by this garden let. So the, the control plane of this shoot is basically also hosted here. Okay, uh, so what we now want to do is um, show the heartbeat feature. So you see when you do kubectl get seeds uh, that there is a ready status. And I'm now scaling down the garden let deployment. So it will no longer run in order to send these uh, heartbeats. It will take some seconds. Uh, and after that, 
some threshold time, the, the garden controller manager will then identify that the garden let didn't respond anymore and will set the status here to not ready automatically. This is more or less the same that happens when the kubelet suddenly stops to report the node status. In the meantime, we can also check um, the seed status and what we see here. We basically have this uh, ready condition that was just set to not ready by the Gardner controller manager. And we have another condition that indicates whether the seed cluster has been bootstrapped successfully and is ready to, yeah, to schedule control planes of shoot clusters. So if we now check again, this condition here has been set to unknown by the controller manager because it simply can't yeah, judge anymore if the seed is, is healthy or not because no responses came anymore. All right. Um, then next demo. First scale it up again. Next demo would then to register a new seed, which basically is deploying the garden let into this cluster. And yeah, together with the bootstrap cube config. And then we should see that it automatically registered, uh, registers itself and uh, yeah, gets known to the Gardner control plane. So just to show, um, this here is a, a GCP cluster I created. It's a plain cluster, so nothing other than the system components are installed. And we now want to register this one as a seed. What we first have to do is to create a bootstrap token, as mentioned, so that the Gardenlet can get itself a correct client certificate. Um, let me take a look how the bootstrap token looks like for those that don't know it. So it's basically a Kubernetes secret that has a special type that is implemented by uh, Kubernetes. And it has a token ID and the token secret itself an expiration timestamp, a description, and some settings. And the bootstrap cube config would simply use these two, so the token ID and the token secret. Uh, and this would, for example, look like this here, where you can specify in the user section simply the token. This is the token ID separated with the dot and then the secret. And with this, uh, cube config, the garden let can create this certificate signing request object. And after that, it downloads the client certificates and creates a new cube config where it no longer uses this token, but the just received client certificate. All right, so let's create this. Yeah, it's created. And now the only thing we have to do is we create the garden namespace. Uh, will be automated, have to do it in a separate step. And uh, then provision the, the helm chart of the garden let. If you take a look here, this is the, the helm chart values of the garden let. We specify the image tag and then the configuration, um, which is more or less very similar to how the Gardner controller manager configuration looked like in the past. The bootstrap cube config is here. Um, and the seed config is here below. So after it's got a valid client certificate, it creates a seed object based on these specifications here. Here we watch the garden namespace of this cluster. The garden let is coming up. You see it created a certificate signing request, which was auto approved by the Gardener controller manager. And the seed object here got already registered. The garden namespace of the seed cluster is bootstrapped with a certain standard deployments that we need in order to yeah, provision shoots later. But from this point in time, uh, the scheduler would now take also this GCP seed into account. Yeah. 
Um, then I wanted to show a fourth demo that I can't show at the moment because it's not working. It would simply be to annotate this existing shoot that we have in the garden namespace um, and to mark it that it shall be a, a seed cluster as well. And then we should see that the garden uh, deploys itself into this cluster, which in the end results here in the same process. So this step here, Helm upgrade is then performed by the garden itself more or less. Um, yeah, so in the end, the, the Gardener controller manager has been, been split as said. It still has the control loops that don't need to have in any interaction with the seed or shoot clusters. So the control loops for the cloud profile, for plans, for projects, controller registrations, and so on. And it also has the, the shoot uh, hibernation control loop because here only the shoot specification is changed, but no interaction with the seed is, is done. Uh, the same for the shoot maintenance loop. Here is also only the specification changed. So the Kubernetes version is changed or the machine image version, but no communication uh, to the seed is necessary. And it has the, the shoot quota controller, which also only modifies the shoot resource. It basically deletes it after this trial expiration date is, is expired. And the garden let uh, is now getting the, the backup bucket and backup entry uh, control loops, the controller installation control loop. So it installs its own extensions based on, on the information that it downloaded from the garden cluster. It has the, the seed uh, bootstrapping as we saw and the shoot reconciliation of course and the shoot health check. So we also now have two separate hand charts for the gardener. One is for the control plane and then a separate one for the garden right here. Yeah, that would be everything from my side. Are there questions or comments? Uh, the CSR is not actually deleted once it's approved uh, and it's used. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the same for, for Qplet uh, CSR. So. I think there is some token or some, some CSR cleaner controller in the cube controller manager yes. yeah, that but, regularly yes, deletes them. So it will be gone after some time. So the bootstrap token is actually deleted by the Gardner controller manager. We could also directly delete the CSR uh, as soon as the seed has registered itself. But yeah, it wasn't done for the cubelet as well. So they rely on this uh, garbage collector controller, apparently. Thanks a lot, Raphael. Uh, are there any additional questions to this topic? Seems not to be the case. Uh, are there any topics? Uh, which are not on the agenda you want to discuss? Seems also not to be the case. Then uh, thank you to all the speakers and see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.